Our next speaker is Emily Peters. We're going to talk about categories generated by five elements. Thanks. Um, so, thank you for the invitation to be here, the opportunity to give a talk and to hear a lot of interesting talks. Um, first of all, what I'm talking about is mostly in the latter half joint work with Scott Morrison and Neil Snyder. And as of today, it has an archive identifier. Um, but the goal for my introduction is to talk about just generally diagrams for categories. And I know that we've seen a lot of these so far, and I know that when I was starting to learn this material, uh, I found a lot of this very confusing. So I have a little bit prepared, but I hope that you will take this as an opportunity to ask questions. Um, so, okay, so we've already seen this a few times already, but a tensor category is something where we have a tensor operation on our objects. So we have these objects, and in addition to being able to take sums, maybe formal sums of them, we can also take tensor powers. There's an identity for the tensor power. There's product. Oh. Uh, product, yes. There's an identity. And there are duals. And then the other thing we say is that to make this a tensor category, in order to enable us to use tools from linear algebra to have something to say here, the morphisms between objects form vector spaces. Okay, so you could also say that this is uh, what, a monoidal C linear rigid category, but uh, basically these are, this is sort of a, this is the definition in terms of the properties that we're going to want to use. And so then a fusion category is all of this and more. So a fusion category is a tensor category where we also have semi-simplicity and our unit object is genuinely simple. And finally, want there to be a finite number of simple objects, or maybe a finite number of isomorphism classes of simple objects. Okay, and so we've already seen some examples of these. So um, in Mike's talk, we saw the Fibonacci category, where you only have two simple objects. Uh, did you call this sigma? I'm going to call it tau. No, no, tau? Okay, great. So I'm going to call it tau. Um, and the fusion data is really pretty straightforward, okay? Our identity behaves like you'd expect it to. And when you tensor the other object with itself, you get back a copy of the identity, and you get back tau. And we also have, again, from next talk, the SU2 at level 4 category, which had four, uh, five objects, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and, uh, well, I'm not going to write down the whole table of fusion data, but, okay, and so, um, right, so, what I want to talk about, uh, is these diagrams that we draw for these categories. So we can represent various morphisms as labeled diagrams and um, you know, 
know, the amount of data that's in your category sort of controls how many labels you have to put on. Like, we, so for instance, in the Fibonacci category, right, we could really skip the labels altogether because one convention is that for the trivial object, uh, since it is trivial, often we draw it by not drawing it. So what that is to say there's an invisible string up here perhaps, or now there's also a morphism from tau tensor tau back to itself. And so that's what this diagram represents. Um, and in some bigger category, you could imagine that there were, you know, multiple maps from a certain product, a tensor product, into another thing. So then you maybe have to specify some data at the vertex to say what you were working with. Um, okay, so there are actually only a couple ingredients that um, we can get kind of a lot of mileage with these diagrams from. So we can draw tensoring with your dual as just drawing a cap. And so this is a map from x tensor x dual to the trivial object. And conversely, if we have a cup like that, this is a map that sends the trivial object into the x tensor x dual. Okay, and very often we'll have structure like this one, um, which in Scott's talk was doing the work of uh, uh, the multiplication for an algebra object, right? So this is a map from, oops, let's make that a little more different. If we have a diagram like this, this is telling me to go from x tensor x to the space x. And if we had it the other way around, This would be the co-product sending us from x to x tensor x. Okay, and now I haven't told you like under what circumstances you can draw these diagrams or you know whether you can get all morphisms as diagrams. Um, but what I'm interested in today are a very simple kind of category that I'm going to call a trivalent category. And what I mean by this is okay, it's a fusion category C. Uh, and it's generated, well, its objects are generated by a single generator, which will insist is self dual. Call this X. And then the morphisms are going to be generated by a trivalent vertex. So this is going to take, okay, instead of drawing it in one of these configurations, I'm going to draw it like this and just point out and just uh, add in here that it's required to be rotationally symmetric. Uh, I do require it simple, yeah. And, well, I'm going to phrase that in a sort of funny way. Wait, it's going to look strange. But, okay, so what are the... Additional constraints that I want to add. So, okay, I just need a piece of notation first that CN is defined to be the space of maps from x tensor with itself n times into the trivial. Okay? And now the conditions that I want are that my first few spaces are small in the following sense. So C0 is one dimensional. This isn't even so much a requirement, right? This is saying that there's only one up to a multiple, there's a single map from the identity to itself, and that's the condition from fusion categories, or from te yeah, that the object one is simple. And then the next thing that I ask is that C1 
one is zero dimensional. Okay, and this is saying that there's no map from the object X to the unit. Okay, so X is not the unit and X is not a simple object, or X is not some sum containing the unit. Okay, now the third condition that I want is that C2 is one dimensional. So this is um, from X tensor X down to one. And by Frobenius reciprocity and self duality, this is the same as max from X to itself. And so this is the condition that says that X is a simple object. Okay, and I promise I'll stop after this one, but we're gonna put one more dimension restriction here. We're gonna say that C3 is also one dimensional. And this one doesn't have a sort of straightforward interpretation in terms of these, but what this is saying is that your trivalent vertex uh, generates all the morphisms in your category in some really straightforward way. So, what are so that's saying, saying there's no extra label on the trivalent vertex? That's right, right. That's exactly what it is. It's saying we don't have to specify which map we use to get from X to X. What is Yes, actually, that's a great question because what do I mean by rotational symmetric? So, okay, here I have my trivalent vertex, and you could imagine that I tried to pull this string from the right around to the left. And if I wanted to do that, I would put a cup down here and then a cap up here, and what I would get. Label this region to be tracked, it would be this, which isn't necessarily the same morphism. Right, like, and sort of, I mean, if what you had. Dot, what dot uh, well, that's a very good question, too. Um, I'm just using it to kind of mark this region. Um, algebraically, what this means is that, like, I have a map from. tensor x, tensor x, into the unit, and if I permute one of the coordinates, or one of the, the um, sum, one of the pieces of that, if I pull this over here, it's not going to change. Let me treat it. Do you assume that the kid is that it's very close to you identify x, and the x is going to do all the Yes. Yes. Is that, are there any examples besides the kid that you get for? Oh, yes. <laughs> said we have some, it's a fusion category, and it's generated by the self-dual object X. So definitely one is in there and X is in there. So we have one, we have X. But what we also should do, when I say generated, I mean tensor generated. So really I should take X tensor X. Okay, well this might not be simple, but I can break it into simple objects, and if I get anything new, I should add that in. And as long as I'm getting something new, I should go to the next level, do this again and break it up again and see if I get anything new. Yes? So normally in algebra people build these combinatorial constructions and then take categories of their morphisms to something else and study those categories. Are you going that way? Um, I don't think I quite understood the question. So <clears throat> Typically it is not the combinatorial construction like what you presented which is studied but uh, the space of its morphisms to something else. Well, yeah. Are I you mean, going I am sort of studying morphisms here, right? I'm looking mm -hmm. at these hum spaces. No, I mean um, morphisms of the whole category to something, some other space. That's okay. the typical way algebra works. Uh, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. I'm not so much going to do that, but, uh -huh. um, but I am going to, well, well I'll, I'll get okay. there. Okay, great. So there's one more condition. 
information I need to head over here, which is that um, we get an inner product in the following way, which is that if we have y and z, and y and z are both in cn for some fixed n, then I define their inner product to be what you get by drawing the diagram y and the diagram z and connecting them to each other with n strands. Okay, and just from first principles, this is only a bilinear form. So saying it's an inner product is requiring it to be positive definite. And that's one of the conditions on the category being tried in. So that's a requirement that we're having to. Not the Not positive definite. Uh, yes, sorry, not the definite. All right, can I just question? There's not. maps from x to 1, which is to say diagrams, some sort of diagram we can build with n boundary points. And so these are uh, diagrams built out of these trivalent vertices and cups and caps strings. And so, yeah, so that's, so we really are just taking the two diagrams and putting them next to each other and drawing lines between them. Okay. So, uh, our goal, once we made this definition, is to classify small trivalent categories. Okay, and I'll say in a minute what I mean by small, but um, basically, if you want to classify things, you always end up trying to classify small, because they're the only things that are amenable to this. So we heard from Scott about classifying small subfactors. There have also been efforts to classify small fusion categories, either in terms of their rank or their global dimension. And so this is just a slightly different perspective, a different point of view on these categories, which is to look at them using this trivalent category formalism and just see what we get. And so, of course, the motivation for this is that maybe something exotic will show up. You know, maybe we'll set out to find small things and we'll come up with a list of familiar stuff, and there'll be something on that list that we've never seen before. And it'll be sort of accessible in a way that's something that's bigger. No, no it doesn't. Yeah. What's the measure of smallness? That's, okay, so smallness is... We consider the sequence that we started here, and we don't really take the whole infinite sequence because, right, there's at past a certain point they might not be final. Um, so it's about um, a truncation of the dimension sequence. So, did see zero? Did C1, did C2, okay, and by what I've written down over here, we know that the first four things on this list are 1, 0, 1, and 1, and it turns out for the sake of this talk that small is going to mean that the next number is less than or equal to 4, the next number is less than 11, and the last number is less than... Okay, and now why, first of all, why, does it, why should I only look at a truncation of this? Why shouldn't I care about the later behavior? And so, sorry? Uh, no, I can't. Things will show up that have arbitrarily high quantum.
So right, what I'm what I'm going to try to explain is that um, any number on this list being small gives you smallness for the rest of the numbers on this list. And I'm going to do this by giving one very particular example. And so the example that I want to give is that suppose the dimension of our fourth space, the first one that's not required by our axioms, is less than or equal to 4. So my point is that there exists a square popping relation where Okay, so here's something with four boundary points. I claim I can write this as some sort of linear combination of these other diagrams with four boundary points that are simpler in some sense. Um, you can find lots of different metrics of what it means for a graph to be simple or complicated, but the metric I'm using here is that it has fewer faces. Okay, and now, why should this be true? Right, all we know is that in this potentially huge space of things with at most four, with exactly four boundary points, that uh, the, the dimension is less than equal to four, but why should this in particular be possible to simplify? And so it goes something like this. We consider exactly these diagrams on the right hand side. Okay, and so they might be linearly independent, in which case, since this is a four dimensional space, any other diagram we can draw with four boundary points falls in here. So if D is linearly independent, then we're done. If, on the other hand, D is linearly dependent, then we have a relation among the things in D. And so our relation either involves this diagram or this diagram, as well as the others, maybe both of them, or if it doesn't involve either of the diagrams like this, it involves just these two. So first of all, let's suppose we have a relation where we can write this as combination of the other three. Okay, now what we do is we look at a square and we notice that this diagram here appears here inside the square. And so if we apply this relation in this orange site, what we get back is, let's see, x times this diagram where the i has been replaced by an h, plus y times this diagram where we've got a cup cap in that orange region, plus c times diagram that looks like and now, I've done this a little out of order because really what I should have done first is to tell you that in any trivalent category, we can pop triangles like the one that appears here because this space is one dimensional and so everything that has three boundary points is a multiple of a single so this is equal to some quantity t times the single vertex. And if we look at the space with two boundary points and we consider a bygone, a two-edged thing in there, this also pops, <clears throat> right? Because again, this lives in a one-dimensional space. And in fact, the sort of basic ingredient of this is, okay, this is not a zero, this is a loop, this is a diagram with no boundary points, and since the zero space is one dimensional, this is itself some multiple of the, well, the empty diagram. Okay, and so, the relation I get for the 
square is xt times the h plus y times the i plus zv times straight up and down. Okay, and so if it was linearly independent, linearly dependent, remember I had either a relation like this, or the relation had to only involve the cup cap and the straight up and down strings, in which case, if I have a relation that lets me replace this with some multiple of this, and I look in a square, I can find it in the middle of this square. I apply the relation at this site, and I get W times this, which is W B squared times this. Isn't um, that just impossible by your Sure. Anyways, right, it's possible that this doesn't actually show up, but uh, just for thoroughness, I've included it. So, okay, and so if C4 is less than or equal to four dimensional, then we have this square popping relation. We already have a relation that lets us pop a triangle, or a bygone, or just a loop. And so if you look at the space C5, any diagrams in there that you can draw that have a square, or a triangle, or a bygone, or a loop in them, are linear combinations of other simpler diagrams in there. And so the idea of this is that um, you know things are only ever small relative to each other. And so some category that didn't have a square popping relation would have more diagrams of these higher. And so being small at one level does sort of give us smallness at a higher level in a sort of unquantified way, right? But all of that is just to say that that's justification for using this dimension sequence to measure smallness. Okay. So are there questions? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And uh, presumably it's some kind of special kind of loop. Yes. So what is the special kind of Is that some kind of hat thing or has some kind of physical thing? Or um, you know, some kind of uh, the special kind of thing that is uh, the intensive or some kind of additional thing. So if that's a uh, different kind of I don't know. I haven't looked at it from that point of view. Well, okay, now is a good time to, I mean, maybe you can answer your question um, from the following, which is, the sort of initial classification of um, <laughs> fusion biomass. So this is, this is the tree of life for fusion categories. So the branches tell you, the early, the lower down ones tell you about the smaller uh, spaces in your dimension sequence. So for instance, if you look at your space C4, if it is less than or equal to three dimensional, then what you have is either the Fibonacci category or uh, SO3 at a root unit. Uh, yeah, these are trivalent categories. So this is. So they don't have all categories. These are all trivalent. Everything here is a trivalent category. But do you have an example of which is a Um. I think it's not hard to come up with an example for something that's not a trivalent category by just taking, say, two different generators yeah. that don't generate each other. And yeah, and it's your two level case. Essentially, nothing is trivial. Well, <laughs> Trivalent vertex is rotationally symmetric, it's going to throw a lot of things out. 
<laughs> okay, so we'll let you see a relation of Hora appears up here. And so, okay, but so, right, if, so on one hand, if the dimension of C4 is less than or equal to 3, uh, we know exactly what it is. And if the dimension of C4 is greater than or equal to 5, our tools don't let us say anything about it. So, you know, over here is probably a whole world of trivalent categories that we just don't have anything to say about. Okay, but on the other hand, if the dimension of C4 is exactly 4, then we're in this balance where we can say something about it, but there's still a lot of interesting, there's enough room for interesting things to exist. So, if C4 is four-dimensional, the next thing we do is we look at C5. And if C5 is less than or equal to 10-dimensional, then what we get is either G2 at a root of unity, so it's not at a root of unity. That's any any parameter. No, nope, any parameter. Okay, yeah. sorry. Any complex number. Okay, so we get G two. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm. I, yeah. Okay, sorry. You could erase fusion in the, in the definition of trivalent here, and everything else only says would still be true, and then you don't have to have it be a root of unity for SO three or G two. All right. Fair enough. Okay. So. So I have G2 here twice, you'll notice, once at a root of unity and once at either a generic root of unity or any, any number. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, C5 is 10-dimensional in general, but 9-dimensional in this special case. And the next thing I have down here I've called, we call ABA. And so this is a subcategory of the free product category. So we take a temporary lead category with a particular value of delta, and we take its free product with the Fibonacci category, uh, and I haven't really specified what that means. Um, and then we look at some subcategory of that. We get this back. So first when we were doing this classification, we were like, oh, already when C5 is nine-dimensional, there's something strange showing up. But then we were able to identify kind of enough properties that showed us that it really had to be coming from these other categories. Um, I don't think it's exactly for Scatland. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it, because it's a it's a free product of things as tensor categories rather than things as sub product of the sub factors. So it's, it's a bit different. Yeah. Maybe maybe it's worth saying that uh, that one's never fusion because it's always going to be fairly many samples. Okay, that's a good point. Um, I don't remember which value of delta. It's bigger than one whatever you two? yeah whatever you like. Oh, is it what, either bigger or smaller? Uh, yeah. Yes. <clears throat> yes. And, and now I'm being I'm being very sloppy about this, right? I'm using the fact that we have um, cup cap. Uh, moves given from duality and the fact that it's self-dual to, you know, instead of drawing all my pictures with kind of everything at the bottom level, I'm just kind of now freely drawing them around the circle. So this would be this versus uh, this. And so then, on the other hand, if C5 is more than 12 dimensional, we're in the position where we don't really have any ability to say anything. Our linear algebraic tools don't really apply. But if it's exactly 11 dimensional, we can look at C6. And so here we see uh, one of the categories, Marita, equivalent to the power up tensor category showing up. And so this is. Uh, Constructed by No Snyder and Pinas Grossman. And it's wonderful to see it showing up in this context because, uh, I mean, because the, the power of subfactor 
was first discovered in this context of classifying small subfactors. There was sort of no way to expect that it existed other than stumbling across its graph and being totally unable to rule it out. And so it's sort of lovely that we've taken this different notion of smallness, but it's given us a bunch of familiar stuff. And then kind of at the upper limit of what we can talk about, it gives us the less familiar, but it'd be more exotic, but you know, still known to us, over up. Related. <clears throat> Uh, sorry, this whole thing is the tree of life for trivalent categories. The part that's over here. No, we don't. I mean, sorry, I, it's possible that there are. We don't have any sort of structure over here, right? I mean, you. We may well know some examples that fall over here, but there's not. These spaces are so big that the tools that we're using to kind of do these counts along the way don't have anything to say in these cases. Well, so we know a little bit. So the, the adjoint representation of any exceptional V algebra, like G2 or E67, that falls on that dim C5 equals 5 branch. So there, there are certainly some things off that branch. Um, I'd personally be willing to bet on absolutely no evidence whatsoever, but I like making bets that the top two branches, dim C5 is greater than 12 and dim C6 is greater than 41. But it's not. Uh, I'll let me bet you one bit. Yes, yes. So, right, so where do the numbers here come from? So, uh, this C4 being four dimensional was, we saw, related to the fact that you can draw four different graphs with no faces um, and four counts. And so, okay, what about C5? Well, if you get out your paper and you try to draw graphs with no faces and five boundary points, you find 10 of them. And so then the 11th here is the pentagon. And so, okay, what I'm telling you now is heuristic, but basically what seems to happen is that um, if you, is that you, you, you sort of have your graphs with no faces or maybe one face, and those are gonna give you a basis. And then things with more faces, if you have one of these dimension restrictions, are always going to be able to sort of fall into one of these smaller ones. So this number, well, and it doesn't actually even work quite so nicely up here. Because if you look at diagrams with six boundary points and only one face, there are 37, and, sorry, no faces. There are 37 of those. If you allow faces, then there are 44. So, uh, probably because everything is, but I don't know how. Uh, it's, it's infinite. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. free products will always have infinite and simple objects. Oh. So, Emily, you just said 44, but how do you reduce it to 40? <laughs> um, so that's actually, so what I'm going to do is kind of give you an idea of how this whole thing is proved by proving uh, in particular basically this branch only, mm -hmm. um, and doing that sort of very vaguely, and you'll see hopefully how far it comes into it. Um, actually, it's not that satisfying an answer, but 
um, because, well, in fact, okay, so here's what I'm actually going to show, which is that, let's see, is a trivalent category with C4 being four dimensional, C5 being 11 dimensional, and of C6 being less than or equal to 39, so I'm even going to prove an easier version than what the tree says, then C is the H3 category. Okay, and I think, as I look at these numbers, I think I must have misquoted the sizes of the earlier spaces. I think that Diagrams with six boundary points and no internal faces. I think there are 34 of those. And then there are 41 um, once you include one face. And I'm going to say 39 instead of 40 because uh, I want us to have two relations to work with. Okay. And so, um, right. So the, the thing that I'm going to ask you to take on faith for this theorem is that the H3 category exists and satisfies these conditions. Existence of H3 and its dimension bounds. Okay. And then my approach to the proof of this is going to be basically linear algebra and combinatorics, um, but I do need to set up some notation in order to do that. So, so suppose we're given some collection of diagrams that are all in the same space, so they all have the same number of boundary points. Then the following trichotomy holds. Um, oops, wait, I need a patient before that. So let MD be the matrix of inner products of those diagrams. Okay. And so This, uh, this is a trichotomy that I'm about to set up, and what's lovely about it is that basically accounts for the fact that in this tree we kind of have this triple branching at every level. Um, and that's even coincidental with the fact that these are called trivalent categories, but uh, for some reason when I wrote my notes for the talk, everything came out in threes. So, okay, so either D, this set, is linearly dependent. And so, the determinant of the matrix that we write down is equal to zero. Okay, and then if D is linearly independent, it could be that D is a spanning set for your space. I guess this is not an exclusive trichotomy quite because D could be linearly dependent and a spanning set. But if this was true, this means that we can detect relations by taking inner products with the diagrams in D. Okay, and then the other possibility is that D is linearly independent and does not span. And so, that tells us that the dimension of the space that D is in is more than the number of diagrams in D. Okay, and basically, everything we prove in this tree is choosing D appropriately at the right depth in order to see that 
either you have some relation and you can get some mileage out of that relation, or your set is even bigger than that D and you just kind of can't say anything about it. Okay. So the D's that I'm usually going to be considering, I've already talked about these, but NK is those planar trivalent graphs. square popping relation, so we're often going to want to consider those planar trivalent graphs which satisfy all of these same conditions and have no square fixes. Uh -huh. Probably up here, when I said less than or equal to k faces, I should have said all the faces are four rounds of it, right? None of the faces are triangles. Okay, I'm going to prove the theorem that I've written down in terms of three lemmas. Um, I'm actually doing fine for time. It seems unlikely I'll get through all three of them, but I've ordered them from simplest to hardest, so let's just start from the beginning. So the first lemma is that there do not exist any trivalent categories with dimension of C4 being 4 with 11 dimensional C5 and a relation among the D60 diagrams. Okay. And so So we first relate d six zero being linearly dependent would tell us that a bunch of other things are linearly dependent too. It would tell us that, say, d six one and d six two are linearly dependent because d six zero is really a subset of these. Um, also, it would imply that d zero is linearly independent, is linearly dependent because if we have any diagram with six boundary points, we can embed it into diagrams with seven boundary points by taking the same diagram and adding on one trivalent vertex. Okay, so we take all 34 of these D60 diagrams, and we embed them in D70. And at the same site on each of them, we put one of these extra forks. And then if there was a relation among D60, there remains a relation among these diagrams in D70. Okay, and so, on the level of linear algebra, this tells us that 
So if d6 zero is linearly dependent, that means that all of the following determinants must be zero. matrix of diagrams and you look at it, it turns out that the biggest face you're going to set any diagram you see in there has, okay, so remember D60 didn't have any triangles, bygones, anything like that. When you take these inner products, you get, you add more faces, but you always get one of the small faces. And it turns out that all of these can be completely evaluated in terms of our parameters B and D and T. Okay, so we now have five large-ish polynomials, right? So these are, this was 34 dimensional. Everything else here is bigger than that. So we're taking the determinants of some rather large matrices. So we have some help from Mathematica here. In fact, we have a lot of help from Mathematica here. So these are polynomials in choice of forcing B to be 1 by renormalizing our trivalent vertex. So these are polynomials in two parameters. There are five of them. They're extremely large, but they're not quite as related to each other as you might think from first principles. And so when you take the intersection of all these polynomials, you get a finite number of points. Okay, and so these finite number of points all fall on the G2 curve or the SO3 curve. And for G2, we know that C5 can't be 11 dimensional. For SO3, we know that C4 can't be 4 dimensional. And so this gives us a contradiction to those hypotheses, and so D60 can't be linearly dependent. Okay. Okay, yeah, so I haven't said this, but um, the parameters completely determine the category. Um, the D and the T, well, if you have, if you have D or T at these points, um, you are guaranteed by the, the stuff that I haven't told you about from earlier, that you have relations of a certain and so if you have relations of those form, I mean, you know that, that you fall somewhere among these smaller branches. We, we, prove, we prove slightly stronger recognition theorems than the tree really shows. It's enough. No, but thank you. That's a really good point, actually. Okay. And so the second lemma, very similar. There can't exist a trivalent category with, again, C4 being four dimensional and C5 being one dimensional. And the span of, in this case, I'm looking at those diagrams with six boundary points fewer than or at most two faces, and no square faces, uh, less than or equal to 39. Unless we're at a very particular value of D and T. So 
So D satisfies this quadratic polynomial. And T is this. And this, of course, is the polarized dimension. OK. And so. is very similar. So uh, D61 in this case has 41 diagrams in it. And so if D62 is less than or equal to 39, then there must be a relation among these. of the matrix we get from 6, 1 is equal to 0. The determinant we get from 6, 2 is 0. Same thing with 7, 1 and 7, 2. Okay, and so again, we look for the intersection of all of these curves. And, uh, well, what I'm kind of hiding in the background here is part of the reason that this tree doesn't go any higher. And that is the fact that this is kind of at the upper limit of what our laptop computers can do in a couple hours. Um, so uh, there's already some sort of clever problem solving by Scott that's hiding behind the statement that these only intersect at the following points. Um, And so those points are, again, points that correspond to earlier things on the tree, ABA, or G2. Two is this polynomial here. And three and four are some solutions to very large and horrible polynomials. Um, okay, for the first kind of intersection point, again, uh, we have one of these stronger recognition theorems that tells us that, that at points that correspond to these, we actually are on this branch of the tree. So C5 isn't big enough. Uh, we don't want to rule this point out because it's the one that will give us the H3 category. And for the horrible polynomials, um, so it turns out that what you can do for these is you can compute the rank of the matrix coming from D62 and see that it is equal to Okay, and so that's why there's a 6, 2 in the hypothesis of the lemma, even though it sort of starts out by thinking about 6, 1. Okay, because if this rank of this matrix is this big, then we don't satisfy these conditions. And so, so do I have 10 minutes left? Okay, great. So I can at least tell you the last theorem. which is that if we have all the conditions over here, but D does satisfy these polynomials, and these other conditions, and Span. Let's see. So I think I phrased this a little wrong. So what I really want to say is a uniqueness theorem. So there exists at most one trivalent category. And this is going to look a 
little bit different from the previous proofs. Um, we're not going to get computers to do linear algebra for us, uh, or at least we don't have to. And the way this proof works is that knowing simply the existence of these relations and the non-existence of relations at lower levels down here allows us to deduce actually a lot about the form of these relations. So, okay, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show that in a category satisfying these conditions, there are pentapent and hexapent relations. Okay, so a pentapent is two pentagons next to each other. A hexapent is a hexagon blown down with a pentagon. Okay, and when I say a pentapent relation, I mean that I can write this in terms of diagrams with strictly fewer faces. Same thing for the hexapent. So I have relations that allow me to reduce pairs of pentagons and a hexagon and a Okay. Um, and I will at least show you how we get the pentapent because this is really, this is really lovely. So if you enjoyed the, the square at the very beginning, this is more of the same kind of thing. Okay, so by our first lemma, D60 has, I didn't tell you how many there were, but there are 34 in it. Has 34 linearly independent diagrams. D61 has seven new diagrams. Okay, we get, we're allowed to have one face, we can have a pentagon. We can also have, sorry, a hexagon. There are also pentagons. And there are six different rotations of pentagon that are possible. Okay, so we, I'm going to call these pentaforks because they're pentagons with an extra fork on the end. Okay, so let's see. We assumed that we had 39, at most 39, linearly independent things in D62. And so now we have 41 diagrams, so this means there have to be two new relations, two relations involving these D61 diagrams. Okay, and since there have to be two of them, we know that it's possible that they both involve the pentagon, or I shouldn't really say that, really if there are two relations, there's a whole two-dimensional space of relations. And so, if there's only one relation, you might worry that you could write the pentagon in terms of a bunch of hexagon, in terms of a bunch of smaller stuff that didn't involve pentagons at all. But since you know that there's two dimensional space of relations, you know you have to have a relation involving the pentaforks, and by what do you call it, row reduction, uh, you can get rid of the hexagon. And so there exists a relation of the form. And if they show up in a relation, it has to be rotationally symmetric. Okay, I mean, if there was a non rotationally symmetric rotation, you could take all five rotations of it and add those together and get a rotationally symmetric relation. So if omega is a fifth root of unity, our relation looks like. Uh, equals zero, and of course, this is modulus a bunch of stuff. This is modulus the diagrams in D60. Okay, so with this relationship, I'm just not worrying about smaller things because what do I want to do? I want to reduce the pentapent into a smaller space. Okay, and so here's the trick. 
here's how I get these kind of forms to give me a kind of n. I take this relation and I add an i onto each of these six diagrams. One, two, three, four, five. So that gives me a pentagon next to a pentagon. And this next one, counting vertices one, two, three, says that this thing is a triangle. This one is also a pentagon. Everything else is a square or smaller. I don't know, we can pop squares, we can pop triangles. And so, well, of course, really I should have stitched one of these things onto the D60 diagrams over here too. What I've shown is that plus omega squared times the pentapent rotated by two clicks. Uh, I think I want, doesn't matter. This is equal to zero to mod. Yep. Well, that, that wasn't right for whatever you did. You drew extra forks on the end. So. I did. That's terrible. Okay. Okay. So the point is that if I, so this tells me that mod the diagrams of D61, I can rewrite a pentagon as a rotated pentagon. So it's the two click rotation, there are six boundary points. Do this three times. And we end up seeing that. Pentapent is equal to minus itself. Mod lower order terms. Okay, and of course the only way for this to be true is for it to be equal to zero mod these lower order terms, and so in fact the pentapent can be Produced. And so now what I don't have time for is to tell you about uh, lovely results from combinatorics and graph theory, uh, the discharging method, that tells us that we're guaranteed in any closed planar trivalent graph to have either a bigon, a triangle, a square, or a pentagon. Um, that's just the Euler characteristic. But say you don't want just a pentagon, say you want something a little stronger, you're guaranteed to have a square, something smaller, or a pentapent or a hexapent. And so that tells us that this relation that we found actually determines, so we found a pentapent relation, similarly we can find a hexapent relation, and this determines all the coefficients in our category. Okay, and then we invoke some uniqueness there of saying that once we know all those numbers in the category, we actually know what the category is. And so that more or less proves what I set out to prove which is now erased. Um, it's up, it's up oh, it is, excellent. Okay, that proves this one. Run those one, two, and three together. Prove that that branch of the tree, if we had a 39 instead of a 40 on it, are going to give us uh, our only those. And the way we get from 39 to 40 is actually just kind of doing graph theory like this and being a little bit more careful and paying closer to Are the coefficients of your relations always some cyclotomic uh, integers? Uh, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Go on. Nothing. And that is also in the paper. Um, it's less interesting. Wait, there's E6? No, because um, E6 has two trivalent vertices. And so, so, so we're only looking at things generated by a single point. Yeah. 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 
but it's not generated by the, yeah, the morphism. Yeah. Uh, it is in one. Yeah. Whenever the whenever the rotational eigenvalue is, isn't one, t has to be zero. And so in fact, all of the examples there have t equals zero. Yeah. Small by definition is what we've written a paper about by now. Separated by from another pentagon by two different septagons or something. So, like there is a notion of smallness. 